The speed that we lift and lower weights during training isn't going to be the most influential factor determining the amount of muscle we build, but it can have a small impact on the hypertrophic stimulus and it takes no more time and effort to manipulate, so it is probably worth at least considering. So what rep speed is best for building muscle? Does this change when we talk about the lifting versus lowering phases? And can we strategically implement pauses during each rep to maximize the hypertrophic stimulus? To answer these questions, we first need to understand the different types of muscle actions. There are three main muscle actions that occur during typical resistance training. First are concentric contractions. This is when the muscle produces force as it shortens. This typically occurs during the lifting phase of the movement, such as lifting the dumbbell up during a biceps curl. Second are eccentric contractions. This is when the muscle produces force as it lengthens. This typically occurs during the lowering phase of the movement, such as when the weight is lowered down under control during a bicep curl. And third are isometric contractions. This is when the muscle stays the same length as it produces force. This would occur if we were to pause a lift at any point during the movement, such as holding the weight at a 90 degree angle during a biceps curl. So the question is, how fast or slow should we lift during each phase? First, let's cover concentric muscle actions. In short, it probably doesn't matter all that much how fast or slow we perform the concentric phase. This is because concentric contractions will naturally slow down throughout a set. The closer to failure you train, the slower the concentric rep speed will become. And if you trained to complete failure, you would eventually not be able to perform the concentric at all. For example, this study compared bar speeds in lifters performing back squats. As we can see, during a typical set at 80% 1RM, concentric speed decreased as the lifters got closer and closer to failure. So while concentric speed will inevitably slow down, is it worth going intentionally faster or slower in the earlier stages of a set when we do have the ability to control it? We don't have much data looking at the independent effects of concentric tempo on hypertrophy. However, we sometimes see slightly inferior outcomes when the concentric rep speed is intentionally slowed down too much. For example, this study compared the effects of training with regular versus super slow concentrics. 34 untrained women performed squats, leg press, and leg extensions for three sets of 6 to 10 reps, two times per week for six weeks. One group trained with a 1 to 2 second concentric and eccentric tempo. Another group performed the same protocol but with a 10 second concentric and a 4 second eccentric tempo. After six weeks, it was found that quadriceps muscle fiber cross-sectional area increased in both groups, but the regular tempo produced greater gains. So while we probably want to avoid super slow concentrics, could it be beneficial to perform fast concentrics, at least in the earlier reps of the set? Well, there is limited evidence to go off, but it is possible that lifting a little faster where it is possible might have a slight benefit for muscle growth. This study compared the effects of various different muscle actions at different speeds on muscle growth. Subjects performed three sets of leg extensions three times per week for 12 weeks with either one of the following five different protocols. Specifically, let's compare these two protocols, the faster concentrics and the slower concentrics. It was found that quadriceps muscle volume increased in all groups to some extent. And when comparing the faster to the slower concentrics, muscle growth was similar, with slightly superior growth seen in the faster concentric condition. While this evidence is pretty weak, it is possible that trying to intentionally perform the concentric phase a little faster might have a small benefit for muscle growth. However, it is unclear if this would actually have any meaningful impact during a more typical resistance training protocol, where we are performing concentric and eccentric actions close to failure. But it does seem that we probably want to avoid intentionally slowing down the concentric phase too much if we are able to lift faster. Next, let's move on to eccentric muscle actions. This is where we can have the largest influence on tempo and subsequently hypertrophy. The reason for this is because we are stronger eccentrically than we are concentrically or isometrically. 
If we look at the load velocity chart, we can see that as load increases, concentric velocity decreases. In other words, we lift the weight slower when the weight is heavier. And eventually when the load is too heavy, we can't lift it at all. However, even with loads that we are unable to lift concentrically, we are still able to somewhat control it eccentrically. In practical terms, this means that as we get closer and closer to failure, we can still intentionally control the eccentric portion however we like. In fact, even once we have reached complete failure, we are still able to lower the weight down under control, we just won't be able to lift it back up. So since we have the ability to control the eccentric phase of every rep, the question becomes, what speed should we control the eccentric phase? Well, it seems that we want to at least somewhat control the eccentric phase of each rep. This is because we want the muscle to be actively working, as opposed to the load passively falling under the forces of gravity. And we generally find that lifting with somewhat controlled eccentrics leads to slightly superior muscle growth compared with faster eccentrics. For example, this study compared the effects of performing bicep curls with different tempos. 12 lifters with at least one year lifting experience performed three sets of preacher curls for eight reps with progressively increasing loads two times per week for 12 weeks. Half the subjects lifted with a one second concentric and a one second eccentric, while the other half lifted with a one second concentric and a four second eccentric. After 12 weeks, it was found that both groups saw increases in biceps cross-sectional area, but the slower eccentrics produced superior gains. However, slower eccentric rep speeds don't seem to continue to be more effective the slower and slower we lift. We tend to see similar muscle growth when comparing different eccentric rep speeds of moderate durations. For example, this study compared the effects of performing leg extensions with either a 2 or 4 second eccentric tempo. 10 untrained adults performed 5 sets of single leg leg extensions for as many reps as possible with 70% 1RM 2 times per week for 8 weeks. One leg was trained using a 1 second concentric plus a 2 second eccentric tempo, while the other leg was trained with a 1 second concentric plus a 4 second eccentric tempo. After 8 weeks, it was found that quadriceps muscle thickness increased in both legs, with marginally superior gains seen with a slower eccentric tempo, but wasn't considered statistically significant. So overall, it seems that we want to control the eccentric tempo to some degree. However, the exact duration probably doesn't matter all that much within a moderate range. In fact, this review paper suggested that eccentric rep speeds of anywhere between around 2 to 6 seconds all seem to produce similar muscle growth. So practically speaking, lifters should probably focus more on simply controlling the load throughout the entire range of motion and taking each set close to failure, rather than trying to prescribe a specific eccentric tempo duration. Another consideration when discussing tempo for hypertrophy is the use of pauses. By pauses, we are referring to stopping a rep at any part of the lift so that there is no movement. This could be at the top of the lift, the bottom of a lift, or somewhere in the middle. So the question is, is it ever recommended to pause reps at any stage to improve the hypertrophy stimulus? Well, we don't have any good data on this, at least not in the way that we would practically implement pauses, which makes it difficult to make any confident conclusions. However, based on indirect evidence, there may be some potential use for pauses. There are two potential beneficial strategies that we might be able to take advantage of via pauses. The first is via loaded stretching. Loaded stretching appears to be somewhat hypertrophic alone when performed for long durations. For example, this study compared the effects of long duration static stretching versus resistance training on pec muscle growth. 81 untrained adults performed either intense pec muscle static stretching for 15 minutes, 4 times per week for 8 weeks, or chest flies for 5 sets of 12 reps, 3 times per week for 8 weeks. It was found that pec muscle thickness increased to a similar magnitude via both the stretching and resistance training protocols. This doesn't necessarily mean that we should replace lifting with stretching. Instead, it provides some mechanistic evidence which might explain some of the findings we see via resistance training. 
More specifically, when we train a muscle in a more stretched position, it appears to produce slightly superior growth compared with training a muscle in less of a stretched position. We can train a muscle in a more stretched position by manipulating both the range of motion used and the exercises we select. For example, this study found slightly superior hamstrings growth from the seated versus the lying leg curl since it puts the hamstrings in a more stretched position. While this study found slightly superior calf growth from performing full range of motion and partial rep calf raises in the stretched position compared with partial reps in the shortened position. So all this is to say that if we were to pause our reps in the stretched position, it can allow us to accumulate more time under tension in a loaded stretch. And it is possible that this could produce a little more muscle growth compared with transitioning straight from the eccentric to concentric phase. Exactly how long we should pause to maximize the hypertrophic benefits isn't clear, but probably just a brief pause of 1-2 to two seconds should be sufficient. Although we should keep in mind that if you were training with a full range of motion, controlling the eccentric and training close to failure, the possible benefits here are only going to be marginal, if there are any at all. An example of how this could be implemented would be to pause our calf raises for a few seconds in the bottom position to get a loaded stretch between each rep. And the other way in which pauses might be used for the purposes of muscle growth is for extending a set. This involves pausing in a position which requires minimal active tension. This essentially provides intraset recovery time for the target muscle to dissipate a little fatigue. This would typically be used as we approach failure in order to extend the set by a few additional reps. This can have two potential uses for hypertrophy training. One is that it could be used as a way to simply extend the existing set. This will likely result in a slightly superior hypertrophy stimulus per set. Or two is that it could be used as a form of rest pause, cluster set or myo rep training. Each additional mini set could be used to replace traditional sets which could make for a more time efficient training session. An example of how this may be implemented could be during an exercise like leg extensions. After performing a standard set close to failure, you could pause in the bottom position for a short time before performing a few additional reps. And the last consideration for tempo is for the stretch shortening cycle. This refers to the elastic recoil we get when transitioning from the eccentric to concentric phase of some lifts. For example, we experience the stretch shortening cycle in the bottom of a squat if we allow ourselves to bounce out of the bottom position. Taking advantage of the stretch shortening cycle typically allows us to lift a little more weight or perform a few more reps, but is this beneficial or detrimental for hypertrophy? Once again, we don't have any direct evidence investigating this idea, but chances are it probably isn't going to have a major impact either way, provided that we are training with a controlled eccentric tempo, going close to failure with a full range of motion. However, like pauses, there could be a small effect. Hypothetically, too much involvement of the stretch shortening cycle could potentially be detrimental for muscle growth. This is because, as we mentioned, training a muscle in a stretched position seems to be particularly effective for hypertrophy. And since the stretch shortening cycle occurs in the most lengthened position, we may be limiting the amount of time spent in a stretched position. Instead, we are rapidly transitioning from the eccentric to the concentric phase, essentially rushing the most effective portion of the range of motion. Again, this is hypothetical, but based on indirect evidence, it could be beneficial to avoid too much involvement of the stretch shortening cycle on relevant lifts when the goal is to maximize muscle growth. For example, instead of bouncing out of the bottom during a squat, it may be beneficial to control the movement throughout the entire range of motion. In summary, let's establish some practical recommendations. In terms of concentric rep speed, it doesn't seem to have a major influence on muscle growth since it will naturally slow down as we approach failure. It may be slightly beneficial to perform the concentric phase faster in the earlier reps of the set when we have the ability to do so. And we probably want to avoid intentionally slowing down the concentric rep speed too much. For the eccentric phase, this is where we can have the largest influence on hypertrophy. The most important consideration is to control the eccentric phase to some extent so that the muscle is actively working 
rather than allowing the load to fall under the forces of gravity. However, similar muscle growth can be achieved when training with an eccentric duration of anywhere between around 2 to 6 seconds, provided that we are training close to failure. Additionally, it may be beneficial in some cases to implement pauses at specific times. Briefly pausing reps in the stretched position could increase the exposure time that the muscle spends in a loaded stretch. There is no direct evidence supporting this, but indirect evidence suggests it may be something worth trying. And the other potential utility of pausing reps is for the purpose of rest pause training or extending sets. Pausing reps in a position where there is minimal amount of active muscle tension required might allow a brief recovery period which can allow us to perform more reps. This can be used as a way to extend a single set to accumulate more reps in a fatigued state, or as a way to implement rest pause training. And in terms of the stretch shortening cycle, there also isn't any direct evidence to draw from. But hypothetically, it might be beneficial to avoid too much involvement of the stretch shortening cycle for the purposes of maximizing muscle growth. This is, again, to maximize active time spent in a loaded stretch during each set, which seems to be particularly hypertrophic. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.